Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. And our final passage is found in the book of John, chapter 15. John 15, verses 8 through 17. John 15, starting in verse 8. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you so, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. That's our scripture reading this morning, and young children may be dismissed for Children's Church. Am I good? Now I'm loud. Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, dear Lord. Father, the sun that does shine down and give us life. Father, help us to remember that that is what you want for us, Father, to have life abundantly through Jesus Christ. You sent him to this earth so that we might live, Father, if we believe in him. And not only live, but live in an abundant life for you. Your word is clear what you want us to do, Father, and just help us to take that to heart. Have your spirit pour out upon us today and help us to see the things that you would have us to see from your word and not only see them, Father, but have clear vision to, to enact and have an, a vision, Father, to carry out your work in this world. And Father, I just thank you so much for all that you do, for loving us so compassionately. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. About 350 years ago, a group of travelers set out over the seas, over the Atlantic Ocean, with a vision. They had a vision of coming to a new land, a land where they wouldn't be persecuted, where they could have religious freedom. So they sailed all the way across the ocean knowing that the trip would be hard. It would be life-threatening. It would not be an easy thing. And they got here, and they planted the first colony in the United States. It wasn't the United States then, North America, whatever you want to call it. That's what they did the first year. By the second year, they had set up a town, a town government, By the third year, the town government decided to build a road five miles out into the wilderness for expansion. But in the fourth year, the people decided to impeach the town government because they had lost their vision. They didn't see any reason to build a road five miles out into the wilderness. What would they need that for? Vision is something that if you don't have, you're never going to accomplish great things. And God, can't, God sent Jesus to this earth to die for you that so you could live a life abundantly. That's what the Scriptures say. They lost their vision. And that's what I want to talk about today. How is your vision? Do you have a clear vision of what you and our church should be doing? Or can you only see out just a few miles? Not even five miles out. God has great things in store for us. He has great things in store for each of you. He has great things in store for us as a body. We can't do it on our own, though. We have to get the mindset of Jesus. We can't accomplish things without Him. But with Him, all things are possible with Christ who strengthens me. There's no ocean too great to cross that Jesus can't help us cross. There's no road too long to build that Jesus can't help us build. 
few weeks back we talked about God's story and He's writing His story for this world, for this life. Are you playing your part? Are you writing your roles? Or is Satan winning the battle? You're either focused on following out God's plan, writing His story, or you're not, which means you're focused on Satan's. It's that clear, it's that simple. Not very nice thing to say, but if you're not for God, you are against Him. In Matthew 6.24, Jesus says this. He says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And it's not just money here. It's talking about the things of the world. Idols. We talked about idols before. We don't like to call them that. But if you put them above God's plans for your life, it is an idol. You are serving an idol rather than serving the true God. You either live a life that will bring about the goals that God has, the vision that He has for your life and your church, or you don't. Are you waiting for Him to tell you what to do? I did that so many times. I'm not up here because I was waiting. I'm up here because Lowell saw in me whatever he saw (laughs) and said, hey, will you help me preach? I didn't think I could preach. I don't know if I can preach now. But I said, if that's what you're calling me to do, God, that's what I am willing to do. I never would dream of doing that. I don't have the ability to do that. I still don't have the ability to do that. I'll never have the ability to do that. But if I let the Holy Spirit empower me, I can do that. Amen. So what is vision? Do you have vision? First of all, vision is a noun. It is the act or power of sensing with the eyes. Seeing. How you see things. Not how you interpret things, but how you see things. And you either see them clearly or you don't see them clearly. Light helps you see things more clearly, as we read in the passage this morning. Without light, we can't see color or anything else. We can't see images clearly because of the darkness. As a verb, it means to envision or to picture mentally, especially some future event or events. To envision. To have a vision. To be able to see, you have to do three things. First, you have to have eyes, right? Okay? Then you've got to open your eyes. And then what have you got to do? Use them. And as Christians, so many times, we fail on the use them part. If you notice in the scripture that we read this morning... Jesus said three times, I command you. And I I hate when I see that word. I hate it and I love it. It's that kind of reaction. Because when I see it, I'm like, wow, I know I need to do this now. It's not just, oh, I read it and I don't have to really apply it, but I read it. It's a command. Jesus is calling me to love one another. And that means the people that I don't want to love. But He is commanding me to do it. And in this passage, He said it three times. We need to envision what God has in store for us. We need to open our eyes and we need to set goals and plans. We need to act. Psalms 119.18 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Jesus tells us, or God tells us to open our eyes here so that we can see what? Wonderful things. Satan tries to deceive us. He is a conflict in the story. He wants us to focus on, with our eyes and with our hearts, things of this world. Things that we think will bring us happiness, contentment, peace, but instead lead to destruction. Only by reading and studying God's words, by having wisdom, the fear of the Lord, and focusing on serving Him, can we see clearly. And we will see wonderful things when we study His law. Blind people have eyes, but they can't use them, right? A lot of times blind people will use a seeing eye dog to help them. But it's kind of ironic. Seeing eye dog cannot see for them, can it? It's really a guide dog or guide animal or service animal. It provides a service, and that service is to help guide them. So they have to use the animal to help them along their way. It can't see for them, but if they trust them, just like if we trust God and His Word, then the animal can lead them on a path that is not dangerous, that can take them to the goals that they have, going to the grocery store, whatever it may be. There's a sitcom out now called... um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. 
drawing a blank. Do you remember what it's called? Growing Fisher. And it's about the guy, the guy that does the State Farm commercials. And he's blind. And he's been blind his whole lot, well, since he was 12. But he has a law firm. And all of his clients and stuff never knew he was blind because his brother is part of his law firm. And his brother will come in and scope out the situation first, like when they have a meeting, and say, okay, this table's at this position, this position, and stuff. And like when somebody hands him the check, he says, oh, you won't be able to pay for the check. And I don't remember what his name is. Mel is his name. He said, oh, you won't melt. So he knows to reach out his hand and grab the check at that point. He can't see, but he totally deceives them because of what way he does things. But in one of the episodes, he got a guide dog, and he did not trust that guide dog. And the guide dog kept stopping for this and that. And he forgot to trust the guide dog. And one time the guide dog stopped. Well, the guide dog is standing right here. And right in front of him is a manhole. And he keeps on and says, go, Elvis. The dog's name is Elvis. So finally the dog went. What happened to Mel? He fell in that manhole. That's what happens if we don't trust God and His Word. We will fall into pits. We will fall into sin. We will fall into the snares that the devil has to entrap us. And then we give him a foothold in our life. And all he needs is that one little foothold to start climbing. We need to have a vision. We need to trust the Scriptures because they are our seeing eye dog. They will guide us. They will protect us. But we have to trust them and we have to follow them. God's law is our guide. It is our direction. If we trust God, He tells us that we will find wonderful things. Not just things, but wonderful things. He will protect us along the way. But we have to be doers of the Word and not just hearers only. So how important is it for Christians to have a vision? Well, people who want to succeed, if ask anybody that wants to succeed, they commonly set goals. It's a very important part of them attaining success. You hear it in church circles or in Christian groups with having or getting a vision. So do you have that vision? You don't have to sit and search scriptures for what it is. Scriptures are clear with what you're supposed to do. You're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. You're to go and teach and preach the gospel message to all the ends of the earth. It's there. You've got to just grasp that vision and apply your life to doing that vision. Matthew 6.10 says this, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus was teaching us how to pray. And when we pray, it's not our will, it's not our wants, our desires, but God's will, His desires, His plans, that His kingdom come and His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our purpose is to glorify God, to reflect the light of Jesus Christ so that we can draw others to a restoration and a loving relationship with God. God loves you. That's the whole reason that you're here in the first place. He created you so that you could be in a relationship with Him. The reason that Jesus came to this earth was because He loves you. Jesus knew God's vision, and He died for you. It wasn't easy. He suffered much. And He even said, take this cup from me if you will, but He knew what the vision was. He knew what the importance was. And we're supposed to reflect that. We're supposed to live a life that shows that. Our church mission, if you look on our bulletin, says, or our church vision, if you want to call it that, to know Christ and to make Him known by establishing and maintaining loving relationships. Are we doing that? That is what Jesus said earlier. He said, I command you, love one another. He also says that they will know you by your love. They will know Him by your love. P.K. Bernard said this, A man without vision is a man without a future. A man without a future will always return to his past. Scriptures kind of say that. It says a dog will return to his vomit, doesn't it? Puts it into a little more perspective. That's nasty. That's what it's getting to. Your past was nasty. Your past was sinful. Your past was something that led to death. You did not have life. But because Jesus Christ came and died for you and you realized it, then you have eternal life. But a man without vision will return to that past. Now, I'm not saying you'll lose your salvation or anything. I'm saying that you need to have vision so that you can move forward. 
Proverbs 29, 18 says this, Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed are those who heed wisdom's instructions. I've got some different versions of that. The King James Version says, Where there is no vision, instead of revelation, the people will perish instead of cast off restraint. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. New Living Translation says, When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. And the message says, If people can't see what God is doing, His vision, His revelation, they stumble all over themselves. Isn't that so true? What we think is right is the things that's making us stumble and fall the most. But when they attend to what He reveals, they are most blessed. Vision is the bridge that we use to reach some future goal that we want to, to reach. And that goal is that we reflect a life that shines like Jesus Christ so that others may be saved. Without that bridge, it's pretty tough to, to get there, isn't it? But with that bridge, it makes it a lot easier. But you have to use that bridge. You have to trust that bridge that it's secure enough to take you there. You have to trust God that His plans and His goals are what is important, not yours. And you need to focus on those. Without them, what happens? We run wild. We cast off restraints. We stumble all over ourselves. Or we perish and die. So is vision important? I would think so. Vision gives us purpose. It helps us achieve our goals. And without visions, we'll be wandering around taking the easiest path, because that's what we do. Why would we want life to be hard? Isn't it supposed to be easy? That's what the world tells us. We're supposed to deserve a break today. We're supposed to have it our way. Or are we supposed to live a life that glorifies God? Scriptures don't say it'll be easy. In fact, whenever you start, Satan starts attacking you. He doesn't want you doing what you're doing. And you can't defeat Him. You can't stand up to Him. But God can, if you let Him empower you. I'll give you a couple examples of people with vision. What about a high school student? When they get out of school, they have to say, well, what am I going to do for the future? What do I want out of life? And depending on what their vision is, both ways, how they see, if they see a distorted view of this earth, or what they envision for their future, Either way, depending on that, they make a decision on what they do. So one example, a young man takes and decides to join the military. Well, why would he do that? That's not an easy road to travel. You guys know that have been in it. He chooses the military because of the future goal that it has, the rewards that it will pay off. Does that mean it's going to be easy? Well, the first thing he does when he gets to boot camp is they shave his head. A teenager with his head shaved, the hair is what he lives for, right? They shave his head. Does it take away his dignity? No. He just finds out that his hair didn't mean anything. Next thing, he has to get up early in the morning at the crack of dawn. Well, he doesn't get up till noon. Why would he want to get up at 4 a.m.? And, and he gets up and his sergeant is yelling at him. That's worse than his mother, right? And not only is his sergeant yelling at him, he's telling him he's a mama's boy and what his mother is. His life has changed dramatically. And then he has to get out and start doing training, hard work, running miles, doing things. Why? Why would he put himself through that abuse? Satan tells you life's supposed to be easy. Do what you want to do. He sees the value. He has a vision. He sees the goals and rewards that he'll have. So he endures so that He will reach that future goal, future reward. What is our future reward as Christians? Eternal life with God. God who is the creator of everything that is good. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. I don't know about you, but I've been laying blocks at the house. I can't hardly walk. I go to walk down the steps and I'm like, I'll be glad when I'm in heaven. Because my body is aching now. No more of that. No more disease. That's what we have to look forward to. Do we win? Wow, do we ever win. So that is our future goal that we're working for. Okay, take the teenager that goes to college. Okay, depending on his vision, he either goes to college to 
escape from having to work and face life and party, or he goes to work hard at his school and learning so that he can accomplish this career, whatever it is. And it shows because the student that does that spends the time and effort. He doesn't party as much, hopefully not at all. He puts attention to his studies. He spends time with them. He works hard because he wants the payout to be worth it. The person that goes and just parties has no vision. He has been deceived by Satan. Why would you go just to party? What would that prove? But depending on our vision, how we see things, that affects how we face life. And it's so true as Christians. If you can't see that vision of what's ahead, what heaven has to offer you, why Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, how much God loves you, then you'll never pursue that vision. You have eyes. Use them to see. Use them to vision. And then go after that vision. First, you have to open your eyes. You have to see the vision. You have to embrace the vision. And then you have to act. Which calls for hard work and sacrifice. It's not going to be easy, but is the payout worth it? Oh, wow, is it worth it. So what vision do we have? Luke 19.10 says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. It says why the Son of Man came, why He came to this earth. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And as Christians, we're supposed to be like Christ, to be little Christ to be His disciples, His followers. So shouldn't we do the same? Vision is what we see and envision both. It's the lens that interprets life for us. Sometimes, though, we need glasses, don't we? Because we can't see well. I'm going to have to probably get some this year. I had laser surgery many years ago to correct my eyes. But now when I see off in the distance, shapes are getting fuzzier and stuff. And I'd like to go hunting and kill something. I don't want to kill the wrong thing, right? That would not be good. I need clear vision. So at some time I've got to take and put the glasses on so that I can see clearly. So that I can achieve. Hebrews 12.2 says this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You've got all the pieces of the puzzle there. He was a pioneer perfecter of our faith. We need to fix our eyes on Him. He endured so that we could live. Suffering and shame. And the end result, He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And that's the same future that we have in store for us as Christians. Praise God that He loves us so much. Earlier we read Matthew 6.24. Now I want to read Matthew 6.21-24 through 24 to get a full perspective. It says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. The eye is what gives the whole body light. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one or love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Starts with our eyes, what we see. And then our heart interprets it. Your eyes are either full of light or they're full of darkness. God gave us eyes to see. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18 says this, I keep asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You could put the word vision there. So that you may know Him better. I pray that the eyes of of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you. He has called you for some purpose the riches of His glorious inheritance in His people. And that's what He's called you to do. We see through our eyes, but we interpret through our heart. How is your heart? We talked earlier about Caleb 
being wholeheartedly focused on God. And God said he had a different spirit because he was wholeheartedly focused. And that means sometimes you've got to go against the norm. You've got to go against what's popular. You've got to say, I will trust God alone. And with God, I can accomplish anything. I will accomplish His goals, His desires, not my own. God has called us to be His disciples. The things that we think are important in life may or may not go along with His story. The things that we need to act upon are the things that go along with His story. We need to read His Word, search His Word so we know. shouldn't be any question when we're asked to do this or that, does it go along with Scripture or not. You cannot serve two masters. So what's your vision for yourself and what's your vision for this church? After the plan has been established, you need to set goals so that you can reach that ultimate goal, that ultimate vision. Philippians 3.14 says this, Press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We have a prize. We have heaven in store for us. We have a good job, my faithful servant, in store for us. We also, like I said last week, have to be accountable for every careless word and action we said. So we need to make sure that we realize what our vision is and we focus on that. Goals are simply vision broke down into simple, achievable steps. There's a quote that says, If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And that's so true. If we are Jesus' disciples, then we need to act like Him. We need to be the light of the world just as He is the light of the world. So we need to set goals to reach that. We need to figure out how as a church that we can reach that goal. How do we need to act and be in, in our community to serve others? Just as Jesus Christ came to this earth to serve them and even die for them. Jesus tells us clearly what our vision is. In John 15, 8 through 17, He says this, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in love. If you keep my commands, we'll command again, you remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no, has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because servants do not know their master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love one another. Jesus Christ came because He loved us. God loved us so much that even though we slapped Him in the face, that we spit on Him, that we put a crown of thorns on His head and we killed Him, He still loved us. He defeated death so that we might live and that we may live a life that brings glory to the Father and draws others to Him. Helen Keller once said this. She was asked, what would be worse than being born blind? She replied, having sight without a vision. And that's where we need to be as a church. We need to have a vision on how we can love others, how we can show that light. In your bulletins, I put a little insert. And if you will mark them and put them back in the offering plate, it will tell me what you think are good plans and ways, goals, steps that we can reach our community to love others. I'm not asking you to act now so you don't say, well, am I willing to do this? I'm just asking for ideas and what you think. I'll ask you later how you're going to act. Because it's a shame to have talents and abilities and spiritual gifts given to you from above and not use them. So what goals and visions do you have for your church? 
What steps should we take in achieving our goal? Jesus told us that He appointed us, He called us to bear much fruit, to love one another, and to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. So how does our community need us the most as individuals and as a church body? We need to grow, not become stagnant. To grow, as I said earlier, you have to have a vision. If you're going to succeed, you have to have a vision. If we're going to reach our community, we've got to love. So if you have eyes, that's the first step. Then open them. Then see. We need to see clearly, so we need to study God's Word. We need to pray. And then we need to grab a hold of His vision. We need to envision what He has in store for us. And we have to do that through acting and loving one another. Isaiah 43, 7 through 12 says this. You don't have this one, Kim, so you know. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf, All nations gather together and the people assemble. Which of them foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witness to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say, It is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe and understand that I am He. Before no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I am not some foreign God among you, not the things that Satan tells us. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. People will not know God, or they might say, I don't want to know your God, depending on your actions. If you're a Christian and you don't love, they won't want any part of your God. If you're a Christian and they truly see how much you love, they will see God's love through you. They will want your God. They will want to know Him. You will be responsible for drawing people to Him rather than turning them away from them. I'm going to play a song in just a second, but I'm going to end in prayer. You've got time to write down there in this song, and then after this song, um, they'll come up and sing. So I'm going to close in prayer, and then we'll have the video. Father, thank You so much for Your glorious light. Your light that shines, that gives us colors, that gives us light, that gives us life, that we can see more clearly. Help us to open our eyes and use them, Father, and act upon them to see Your vision for us, to see Your love, and help us to make that manifest in others. Help us to love. Help us to search Your Word. Help us to pray and stay close to You and let Your Spirit fill us, Father so that we may be the disciples that you have called us to be. Help us to love even the unlovable, Father, because that is exactly what you did when you loved us.